The greatest fascination and enthrallment for a spectator is investigating the human psychology and behaviour through cinematic events in a film, as it creates an extraordinary atmosphere of intrigue. Now these words, psychological thriller, it's a subgenre. It is my favorite genre of them all. It consistently manages to fascinate me through realism and less action. The narrative of films that center around the dark psychology of dangerous characters remains to be one of the most widespread areas in films today. You see it in films today and you saw it in films over 40, 50, 60 years ago. These elements, they further analyze a character's capability in order to commit a crime, such as murder another person, as the main example in a film. The term thriller, I wouldn't really classify this as a genre. It is too vague and it's too big. It requires more explanation. Although we know what to expect when watching this sort of film, critics and the audiences, they seem to avoid it altogether. And some others tend to link it to a feeling more than a genre. I completely agree with this. The author David Huckvale states that psychological thrillers are largely about claustrophobia of environment. The human beings who populate the various houses featured in them are trapped, not just physically, but mentally, psychologically. Essentially, the idea is to explore an unstable psychotic state in its portrayal of characters. It contains the suspenseful conventions while also analysing the depths of the human mind. This sanity-based style is so difficult to depict. You can do it in so many ways, almost entirely being impossible to even envision the most official way. That does not exist because we all envision it differently as to what occurs in a person's mind. Hence, all certain possibilities are showcased by different filmmakers in their own way, with cinematography, mise-en-scene, nuanced characters, many motives. Alfred Hitchcock is the main example. He is pretty much known to be the master of suspense. He proves that his films, they share a similar focus of the two elements, fear and suspense, were with films such as Rebecca, the Lady Vanishes, and especially Psycho, which is turned into an iconic film still to this day, and it always will be for many, many more years to come. It has further developed and evolved, and it has borrowed genre tropes from other films across the world, including Japanese animation, also known as anime. Films such as Perfect Blue and Paprika, directed by the same person, they have been the main influence by mainstream Hollywood classics such as Black Swan and, of course, Inception. Whilst sharing that thematic element and genre trope of a psychological thriller, Pretty much, I aim to identify the many ways of how some films manage to incorporate to the complex and ambiguous conventions of this whole genre. And in this video, we will be looking at the classic and iconic American Psycho. There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction, but there is no real me, only an entity, something illusory. One must realize there are so many layers and depths to this film, so if you can't understand and appreciate that, then I'm sorry you will never get a reservation at Dorcia ever. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this video. Or if you need to return some videotapes, then it's okay. I'll, I'll just wait. I'll just wait. I'll be right here. I've got to return some videotapes. I guess I was probably returning videotapes. I have to return some videotapes. Throughout modern cinema, there has always been a dark fascination with the representation of psychopathy, with mostly men who kill out of compulsion. Now, this element has always appealed to me when whenever watching a psycho thriller. It's not merely identifiable what a person's thoughts may be in order to commit a crime, such as murder. 
The film aims to signify how it tracks the influence and development of a serial killer figure by examining Patrick Bateman, played by Christian Bale. Now, I will illustrate how the film uses techniques to blend horror conventions with the psycho thriller, and this directly links to the representation of its spiritually damaged and sinister characterization through masculinity and the contextual background of 1980s. Now, I believe that psychopaths can either be the antagonist, protagonist, or even both, thus emphasizing a very intricate character progression. Despite being warned that it would lead to a career suicide to star in the film, Christian Bale received widespread acclaim for his performance. I believe it was honestly a performance of the ages. And thus, 20 years since its release, the film has emerged to be one of the most controversial but elegantly constructed with a brutal psychological portrayal of the main character's mind. The film focuses on Patrick Bateman, who is a wealthy, New York investment banker who murders just for the thrill of it. He manages to hide his alternative ego from his co-workers as he unveils his violent, hedonistic fantasies while the audience examine the elements of what makes a man a monster. The film has combined dark stylistic choices with a satirical narrative that includes social commentary on critiquing the representation of toxic masculinity and how this would increase the main character's psychological obsession with his own self-image. <laughs> what her head would look like on a stick. The director establishes this by blending Bateman's yuppie persona with his mental disorder by introducing his world of intense masculine competition. This is achieved through unreliable narration throughout most of the film. The audience is pretty much forced to listen to his own thoughts and how he comes across a situation. So let's go through all of it. It is evident that Bateman struggles to assert his authority, dominance in his workplace, as well as society in general. <laughs> Whereas his colleagues seem to thrive and appear to be naturally flawless, Bateman requires complete dedication and too much concentration to his profession as well as his health as the film opens with the classic beauty montage of Bateman carefully explaining his beauty routine and extensive time to exercise. Although this sequence offers some messages of femininity, this is definitely an aspect that directly relates to the main character's thoughts of self-hatred and the state of feeling incompetent. Bateman's self-obsession relates to having no social influence it's very common for his identity to be mistaken with anybody else at work, and as a result, he feels that need to pay money to lower-class prostitutes to go back to his apartment and give him the attention that he believes that he deserves, which he cannot get from other people in his own social status. It's arguable that in a one-dimensional society, you could literally be a psychopathic murderer w without anybody noticing as long as you wear the right suit, have the right job, and otherwise, you fit in. Even Philip Simpson also talks about the serial killer's behavioural patterns and how it's formed and set during childhood, and how it can lead to a murderous aggression because of that intense desire to be strong, powerful, and have full control. So yes, Bateman feels the need to assert his dominance over other people around him. It feeds his inflated ego. But let me explain this more. Let's talk about the business card. This is absolutely hysterical, but a very terrifying scene. Bateman sees his colleagues having more elegant and stylistic business cards than himself. The guy literally has a panic attack and loses his mind over a font, which is exactly the same as the opening film's title credit, by the way. And as a result, he suffers a panic attack in which he narrates and communicates to the audience exactly how he is feeling after his colleagues have shown their own slightly better cards. I can't believe that Bryce prefers Van Patten's card to mine. Look at that subtle off-white coloring. The tasteful thickness of it. Oh my God. 
It even has a watermark. If American Psycho has taught me one thing, then it is this. If you have someone who is mildly jealous of your business card, run, okay? Run as fast as you can and don't look back. At this point, I must give huge props to the editing of this film because of this scene, especially the sound editing, Andrew Marcus does an immaculate job with really communicating that with the audience. Batesman is continuously confronted with hallucinations and therefore he feels as if there's no choice but to kill any threats that relate to this hallucinatory identity. In this case, Paul Allen. Hey, Paul! Bateman would do anything to stand out and look superior over other people. Of course, he lives in a society of people and businessmen who look like one another, talk like one another, dress like one another, they even go to the same barber. Paul Allen hey, Paul! mistakens his identity for someone named Marcus, and this happens throughout the entire film with many, many other people. Only one can imagine what must this be doing to Bateman inside of him. And so it is because of this, he feels the need to express his opinions even further to one-up other people to remain important and relevant within the people around him. Bateman is extremely cautious of how people think of him. We see this in the very first scene of the film at a restaurant. One of his colleagues makes a rather anti-Semitic remark and Bateman feels the need to call him out for it, explaining, explaining that it has nothing to do with what they're talking about or attacking people. Or even during a dinner scene when Bateman continuously lectures on about We have to provide food and shelter for the homeless and oppose racial discrimination and promote civil rights while also promoting equal rights for women. We have to encourage a return to traditional moral values. Most importantly, we have to promote general social concern, less materialism. But it's very ironic that he says this because the next scene is literally the opposite of what he does. As the genre further evolves, the representation of serial killers and psychopathy continue to be an ironic influence within the psychological thriller genre. This is evidence as there have been many similar films recently that have continued to follow on this convention, such as Joker. Both characters, Patrick Bateman and Arthur Fleck, they tend to exploit other people and give an adverse impact to them, yet their lack of empathy and manipulative characteristics help them. Both characters are being ignored and devalued by the society in their own way, whether being portrayed in the upper class or the lower. Both films have created the majority of controversy, but let's go on to the next segment of the video. The film is merely a portrayal of the 1980s New York yuppie lifestyle, and thus it portrays a society filled with greed, egocentrism, as well as hedonism. It relates to the novel, which ultimately explores the same theme. The term is pretty much defined back in 1946 to 1966 as being young, living in large towns and cities, working as professionals in better type of jobs. They have high incomes, nicer apartments, career conscious combined, working hard with a hedonistic lifestyle, a strong emphasis on diet and health, and pretty much being materialistic and non-conformist. Whilst the author may present key ideas for the yuppie culture, I argue that the director uses this to emphasize a double identity within Patrick Bateman's unstable development by using cinematic techniques such as unreliable narration, as the audience may not even realize what is actually real and what is false. And this actually links to a brief description of how the serial killer is psycho, aberrant, depraved, and while still remaining a recognizable product of the American culture. And this definitely outlines Patrick Bateman's character in the film. Throughout, he embodies the young, attractive, and very successful Wall Street yuppie persona defined by consumerism, living in, in the language of ads driven forward by consumption. But then he seems to be hiding all of that from his inner self, who is this sadistic murderer, and implies that there are two juxtaposed identities within him. 
In terms of characterization, the 1980s culture, it definitely contributes to Bateman's psychopathy, definitely through the film's music and soundtrack. I mean, it's ridiculous, but still absolutely genius of a psychopath listening to With that use of diegetic music and the characters as well as the audience being aware of that music, Bateman repeatedly feels the need to listen to music directly before slaughtering his victims. And this actually evidently associates to how the music he admires contains lyrics that he twists the meaning of, using them as justification to feed into and validate his behaviour. Hip to be square. The scene that I will be deconstructing involves this song, and it is when the audience witness Bateman murdering his business colleague, Paul. Hey, Paul! This takes place in the main character's deluxe apartment after spending time at a very trendy restaurant with Paul, who is in a very drunken state. And Bateman purposely does this to gain control and power over a man who is arguably better than Bateman in every way. As you can see, yes, the apartment is illuminating. It links to the character's yuppie personality of being a very successful businessman in New York. He brings Paul back to his apartment, sees the perfect opportunity to strike and eradicate the business rival from his path entirely. While Paul is in no state to leave the apartment, he sits on the sofa as Bateman wields an axe, he wears a raincoat, he shows off to be the biggest fan of Huey Lewis and the news. He plays their four album cassette tape while also sharing contextual information on the artist in a very ironically intellectual manner. There is no non-diegetic sound that can be heard playing. This is before the song Hip To Be Square plays and we observe that Bateman is taking his meds along with the alarming noise of the axe being placed on the floor. Despite the tone of the scene being very intense and very suspenseful and just very psychologically messed up, the atmosphere adds more prominence on Bale's portrayal of a psychopath as being quite humorous and amusing and just slapstick. He's dancing around his apartment realising that he has Paul right where he wants him to be while wearing that raincoat implies his narcissism. He does this while maniacally waxing lyrical about the group, but not to only Paul, but the audience as well. The use of the setting, the, the diegetic music and Christian Bale's balancing performance between being very comical and terrifying, it further places that scene as being one of the most iconic in the entire film, in a very direct response to how Bateman's character was believed to be once a very comedic villain to a narcissistic, psychopathic product of capitalism and materialism in America. There is a moment while being in the bathroom in which the comedy and the satire element completely wears away when Bateman looks at his reflection in the mirror as he saunters out with his axe. All of this causes great effect in being a very slow build of tension with his final words before killing the victim were hey, Paul! and then begins to bring down the axe on Paul's head, bashes him directly into pieces with blood splattering everywhere while of course shouting the iconic By being aware of the importance of trends in music, his profession, as well as his health and very balanced diet, it's very hypocritical and it contrasts to Bateman's main identity, which is mostly hidden but comes alive at night and kills for his own pleasure. Therefore, Bateman's yuppie-filled atmosphere as a Wall Street man, a businessman, it completely juxtaposes his homicidal psychological behaviour as well as his lack of empathy. It emphasises him being a very delusional, unstable character, placing him at the peak of a psychopathic that is a serial killer. And so, with the prevalence of his success, the 1980s yuppie culture proves to be a very new, modern breed of psychos, especially Bateman, ultimately being dubbed as the American Psycho, you never know how many more there may be wandering around a city like New York. It's quite terrifying to think about. The ending. 
One of the most crucial and thought-provoking ways that make American Psycho so significant to the psychological thriller genre is the choice to leave the ending up to the audience's own personal interpretation. Let's briefly summarize what happens in the film at the end. Bateman walks among the streets of New York at night, he is on a killing rampage after shooting an elderly woman, he goes absolutely insane. The police are after him, and any person he comes across, he shoots them dead. He makes his way up to his office, helicopters are in the air on the search for him, he is underneath a desk on the phone with his lawyer to confess of every horrible thing that he has ever done, killing 20 to 40 people, including Paul, hey, Paul. and he discusses a place to meet the next day. And so the next day arrives and the dead bodies in Paul's apartment disappear. The realtor explains that nobody named Paul has ever lived in this apartment, which confuses Bateman completely. Bateman's secretary, Jean, finds a notebook that represents Bateman's psychosis. Patrick meets his lawyer at a bar, who is convinced that the phone call was a prank. He even confuses him for somebody else at first. By the way, Davis, how's Cynthia? You're still seeing her, right? And Patrick basically explains everything to him that he killed Paul Allen, that he killed all those people, but the lawyer says it's impossible because he just met up with Paul, hey, Paul a few days ago in London. And so the film concludes with Patrick questioning everything in, in his life, stating that this confession has meant nothing. With elements such as being in the point of the main character, the spectator can only observe concerning the mind of Bateman. There are many theories out there as to what happens in the film, and obviously I am not going to go through every single one of them, but I'll tell you my personal opinion. I believe there are some things that happen in the film and there are some things that just don't. I don't think Patrick killed Paul. I think his obsession and hatred for him was too much to the point where it was in his imagination. But he definitely is a killer. But at the same time, this video is me trying to look at both point of views, reality or if it's fantasy. Essentially, the ending presents a blur between what is reality and fiction due to the anticlimactic conclusion to the film that summarizes Bateman's insanity. For this idea, we have to go back to the first scene in which we have a whole sequence of shots that highlight Bateman narrating and communicating with the audience while going through his daily scheduled morning beauty routine. It includes an ice mask on his face, exercising his abdominal muscles, showering and applying facial mask as well as moisturizing. Now, I agree that this film is rather unrealistic, but let me tell you something. The most unrealistic part of this film is taking off that face mask in one go. How? Just how? I've tried it so many times. How do you do that? Anyways, all of this suggests that he is out of touch with reality as well as the outside world. While all of this occurs, we are being narrated with a voiceover by Bateman analyzing himself, stating, There is an idea of a Patrick Bateman some kind of abstraction, but there is no real me, only an entity, something illusory. And though I can hide my cold gaze, and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable, I simply am not there. This self-analysis style of a theme, it purposely implies that Bateman is trying to ensure himself as a serial killer, but he ultimately fails as he is helpless in maintaining his reliability as the narrator of his own life. The author, Ellis, includes a unique way of developing Bateman as a serial killer, who believes that his life is this extravagant Hollywood movie, whereas the novel is set in first person, Ellis finds the perfect moment to include a third person narration in the book in which he writes guns flashing like in a movie and this makes Patrick realize that he is involved in an actual gunfight of sorts. He's trying to dodge bullets. That dream threatens to break is gone. The director uses the novel's third person element to showcase cinematic techniques of narration to portray how Bateman's unrealistic thoughts have put him in a state where he be believes his life is 
theatrical. The idea is brought forward when Patrick is standing next to a talking ATM machine that tells him to feed me a stray cat. This immediately brings Bateman into his own film in which he stars as the main villain, especially after he pulls out his gun, shoots an elderly woman passing by, and suddenly causes sirens and police cars to pull up. The chase begins with a very non-diegetic music fading in. It's very, very comparable to an action film. Bateman, he is under an absurd amount of pressure. He has that impression that he is a movie star who succeeds in killing all the policemen, blowing up police cars in the style, of course, of an atomic explosion, without actually having any significant slight of experience in gun shooting. When and where has he taught himself or learned any of these things? It's safe to say that the film has a lot of divisive opinions about the ending of the film. I do understand and realise that although the, the director has absolutely no intention or purpose in making the audience believe that this is all a hallucinatory scenario, you can't help but think that it is. Let's go through some examples. As soon as he kills Paul, hey, Paul, Batesman drags Paul's body in a bag with blood being scattered down on the ground floor. And the security guard does not notice this. He walks by, nothing. There is obvious blood on the ground floor, but no one questions this. There is nobody that walks by and thinks that is a very, very big bag. Why do you need that? Instead, they ask, Ooh. Where did you get that overnight bag? This is obviously a way of juxtaposing Bateman's persona with his psychopathic character, which is a very clever way you can't help but think. These are all obvious questions that the director wants to challenge the spectator with. But overall, this has identified the many aspects and elements to emphasize how the re representation of killers closely relate to the psychological thriller genre. References and examples including very influential killer characters such as Ted Bundy in the film. Did you know that uh, Ted Bundy's first dog, a collie, was named Lassie? <laughs> Had you heard this? The representation and danger of undistinctive yuppie lifestyle challenging the spectator with an ambiguous conclusion and creatively thinking of their own thoughts for possible outcomes display how the film is suitable postmodern portrayal of serial killers. I thoroughly believe that American Psycho it precisely combines both genres of horror, slasher, with the psychological thriller genre there as well. Bateman's iconic character has proven to be an example of a monster that would look normal to any human eye as the film showcases how the majority of the society may not even realise that this is not the case. You're a f ugly f I want to stab you to death and then play around with your blood. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching this explicit analysis. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and please do subscribe to this channel. That would mean a whole lot for me. But I want to hear what you guys think. Did Patrick Bateman actually kill Paul Allen? Or anyone? Let me know in the comments. And I will see you very soon.